Hello and welcome to another episode of The Sit Rep. I am Marine Corps veteran Paul Corbett and today, by popular demand via the email address below, we are covering everything you could possibly want or need to know about VA home loans. This is going to be a long show. So if you are short on time, check out the video description below and you will see that I have broken down the show into short segments so you can skip ahead to the content that you are most interested in hearing about. So today we are joined by someone who is no stranger to the sit rep. Second time. <laughs> and uh, in his career, he has assisted thousands of veterans and Gold Star family members with qualifying and applying for a VA home loan to include service members who are going through a permanent change of station or separating from the military. Rick, welcome to the sit rep, brother. Man, I am pumped to be back. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> I always love hanging out with you and uh, I love this series. I love what you've done with the place and uh, truly honored to be back and provide some education for your, for your watchers and listeners. Hey, it's glad to have you back, man. Um, so, I mean, we want this video to be able to live forever. Sure. But uh, it's, been kind of crazy with the housing market. People are buying yeah. left and right and everything else. Um, and I've done some, I research all this stuff. And uh, last month alone, nearly three quarters of a million veterans searched VA home loan information on Google. Yeah, it's uh, and actually, you know, the interesting piece is 2020, fiscal year 20 for VA, which starts in uh, October 1, 19 to uh, uh, September 30th, uh, 20. They originated and closed. Oh, they guaranteed, VA guaranteed 1.3 million VA loans in that year, which is a record for them. And I just talked to the deputy director a few weeks ago. This year, they're expecting to guarantee or close 1.7 million loans. So two years back to back records. Unbelievable. Wow. 1.7 million veterans are going to either purchase homes, refinance or streamline refinance. But 1.7 million guarantees this year by VA. It's going to be their best year on record ever. So I guess we should probably start the conversation with the simplest question for this topic, and that is, what is a VA home loan? VA home loan created in 1944, and uh, it was a way to help our World War II vets coming back uh, from service to uh, obtain a home that was in good shape at reasonable interest rates as a way to thank them for their service uh, overseas. And it, like I said, since 1944, I think they've guaranteed nearly 30 million VA loans since then. And um, the service requirements, uh, uh, they're, they vary because of the different components of military service, Army National Guard, you have reserves, our active duty, uh, men and women. And so um, you know, it, it is the best home loan option in the United States for those that meet the service requirements. For, as, and I can't, I can't say that enough. So to clarify on this, this is not a benefit. This is just for veterans. This is, this is actually, and that's where I, I have an issue sometimes with some of my countrymen in the, in the real estate industry, uh, mortgage professionals and real estate agents, is that you are actually working with a customer on the benefit that they earn through their service to our country because the VA home loan is actually codified. It's in the CFRs United States law. So that's why in order to make any drastic changes to the VA benefit, such as HR 299, which is the Blue Water Navy Act, you actually need congressional approval to change the VA home loan benefit. Now, VA can make policy changes uh, via the Department of Loan Guarantee, VA Loan Guarantee. They can make some policy changes, but it takes a lot of legal interpretation of the CFRs to make that happen. So this is an actual benefit that you all earn. And I think it's a top three. So you have health care, post 9-11 GI Bill, and I think the VA home loan benefits number three. And is only about 14% of the veterans nationally use the VA loan. Really? That's fact. Just That's low. crazy. Yeah, Massachusetts utilization of the VA loan is about 7%. Fact. There, I get the data. And there's 400,000 veterans in Massachusetts. Yeah, Massachusetts bounces anywhere. You know, we lose some, unfortunately, but we get some new ones in. It Typically, right now, it's bouncing around, I think, between 380 and 390,000 veterans. I mean, you guys have the data on what's actually in our state. So, And I believe there's only about 30,000 active VA home loans at the minute. So... There may be more veterans that have used it throughout the years, but actually on the books right now is about 30,000 VA loans that are active relative to almost 400,000 veterans. So the, the utilization ratio right now is very, very low. Mass has one wow. of the worst in the, in the country. 
So is there's one other aspect of this I want to clarify as well. So if I'm a veteran service member, Gold Star family member, which we'll get into later on. Sure. Um, and I want to get a VA home loan. Boom, I qualify, I get it, everything else, which we'll go through those steps. Where am I actually getting the money from? Is the VA giving me money for my house or yeah. am I borrowing money from the VA? Or so, like, yeah. how does that work? That's a great question. We got a lot of vets that um, just never got, you know, let's be honest, when you guys are in the service, you don't get a lot of education on this particular benefit, right? <laughs> I mean, no. <laughs> so, I mean, as an E3, I'm not buying any house. Yeah, period. yeah right. <laughs> And you just came off base, you got your BAH because you got married and you have no idea what's happening. It's not going to happen, right? So what happens is the VA does not lend money. The lenders lend the money. What VA does, it's established through, uh, through law, is that they guarantee for the lender 25% of the amount borrowed by the veteran. So for simple math, if a veteran in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts paid $400,000 for a home, financed $400,000 for the home, met the service requirements and we're all good. He gets his certificate of eligibility, right? The VA issues the lender a certificate of guarantee, meaning that 25% of whatever that lender lended is covered by the VA. In the event that veteran forecloses, then the lender will get a check from the Veterans Administration for 25% of what was borrowed. So the VA is actually mitigating 25% of the risk for the lender, right? And that's the reason why VA has the best rates, the most favorable credit guidelines, no PMI, and it's the best home loan out there. So VA does not lend money, they guarantee it. Now in rare cases, they, they, they will lend money in very special cases. Um, the Native American Direct 184 VA loan, they will actually fund that, service that themselves for our, our special Native American veterans. Um, but there's, uh, we, we lenders, and we're not allowed to touch the 184 uh, Native American loan. We're not allowed to go near those. They, they take care of them very, very specific, specially. That goes right to the VA regional loan centers. All right. So, so I mean, something else that, oh my God, I've got so many questions floating around my head right now. <laughs> um, it's a lot. I it's, mean, it's, it's going to be a long conversation, yeah, brother. It's all right. Um, so, I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a veteran that's out there uh, or a service member or whomever. Um, I've never used a VA home loan benefit before. Yep. Um, how much can I borrow? So before January 1st, 2020, you were somewhat limited to your 100% financing ability. But then the Blue Water Navy Act, HR 299, was passed, signed, and went into law on January 1st, 2020. So now for a veteran, first time, like you just described, first time use, didn't, uh, doesn't have any other properties, no compromise losses, foreclosures, short sales, nothing. There is no loan limit. If the veteran makes- Wait a, a minute, what? There's no loan limit now. There's no- So VA. I could go, I, so I could use a VA home loan to buy a $10 million home. Um, if the lender will go that high, then yes. Lenders will put some caps on it. Of course, yeah. But but so most of the lenders that I know in the industry are capped at 1.5 because that's a big risk for them, right? Um, there's a couple lenders that'll go to 2.5 million and there's a one or two that'll go to three. So in Boston, I've seen this a lot. I've helped veterans. Um, uh, my biggest was a $1.2 million VA purchase, 100% financing, no PMI, and the rates were in the twos. 30 year fixed, no points. It was bananas. I mean, the veteran had great credit, made a lot of money, no debt. I mean, it was, he qualified for it. And that's the idea, right? The idea was to, the, the HR 299 was designed to provide all veterans, regardless of the state or the county or, or that you live in, the ability to utilize the benefit to its full, full capacity. Prior to January 1st of 2020, veterans were limited by county loan limits as to what they could buy. And that was a mistake because what happened was the VA loan limits got tied to the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loan limits, right? And we happened to be here in Boston in one of the uh, 69 high cost counties. So our loan limits were bigger than say Iowa's, right? Um, but that's unfair. So if a veteran is, so I'll give you a perfect example. What's the county, Massachusetts? Middlesex County, they abut one another. 
right next to each other, adjacent, right? Go to before, veteran would go to <clears throat> um, Worcester County, could only do max 100% financing up to, I believe, was 517. That's it. Or whatever the old loan limit was, it was two years ago, I forget. But if you went one mile east in the, in the Middlesex County, you could go to 690. That's not fair, right? So why should the veteran be, I may not have a lot of cash, so therefore, you know, down payment, whatnot, but I want to buy a house, but I'm limited in middle in Worcester County to 517. But if I go one mile east, and I had a scenario like this that actually happened. I said, hey, buddy, can you move one mile east? It was a regional school district, so he could for his kid. He went from being able to uh, borrow 512, 500, whatever the number was, to 690. 100% financing, and it worked for him. So that was a big difficult. That was a big difficulty for a lot of veterans because they would be put in certain places that maybe they didn't want to. And so with the Blue Water Navy Act now, there is no VA loan limits for first time use or fully restored entitlement. They can just whatever they, whatever they qualify for. So uh, I'm picking up on a couple of things here that you're you're dishing out. Um, one of them is that you kept specifying first time use. Yes. So can you explain that? So VA, um, as you know, uh, right, I see on your wall over here, we have 10% VA disability and what are your benefits, right? So that's a great, that's a, that's a great graphic for me because it automatically triggers in my brain uh, funding fees for VA loans. There's a funding fee, right? And um, the what we call subsequent use is veterans using their VA home loan benefit a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh time. You can use it as many times as they want. The difference is some veterans who are not disabled will have to pay a, a funding fee and then they have to pay a subsequent use fee if they use the VA a second time and they don't have a disability. Whereas a veteran that has a 10% service connected disability or more has no funding fee at all. That's what we call exempt. So they're exempt from the funding fee. Um, but what happens to a lot of, in, in your intro in the monologue, you mentioned permanent change of station. Well, we have a lot of veterans at PCS from one duty station to the next. And when they were at duty station A, they owned a home with a VA loan. But they, they then subsequently moved. <clears throat> Maybe they went from Alaska to San Antonio, right? And when they moved, they're gonna retain the ownership of the property in Alaska, but they're buying in San Antonio. Well. It's kind of too deep to dive into on this podcast because you need some pa piece of paper and some pen to explain it. But they can possibly buy a second VA home loan down in San Antonio, depending on the sale price. But there's a subsequent use fee for that because the active duty member, um, unless they were awarded a Purple Heart and while active duty, would have to pay the funding fee again. So um, you can use it as many times as you want, but it gets, depending on whether you're in service, whether you're out of service, whether you've disabled, if you're in service, did you receive a Purple Heart? And so there's some math that you have. And I, I always recommend to any veteran, wherever you are, make sure you work with a mortgage professional that actually knows what they are doing, that knows this, what we're talking about. Because a lot of mortgage professionals will say, yeah, I do VA loans. And they do like one a year. And they don't, they don't get, they just, they just say it because they want to get paid, right? And I'm, being very honest about that. And um, interview your mortgage professional, ask them if their lender uh, you know, does a lot of VA. You can look up, you can actually look up lender volumes, uh, what they do on a yearly basis on the VA uh, lender resource page. It's public, it's free, you can check it out. Um, and interview your mortgage professional. If they don't do a lot, or if you ask about subsequent use or PCS and they don't know that terminology, bounce, find someone new. So to everybody out there in the audience, I will make sure I get that link from you because yeah. I don't I don't know where it's at, but yeah, they, I, I'll put it down in the video description. Yeah, on the video. VA page, there's a lender page, and on the lender page, you, anybody public can go look up the quarterly, annually lender volume reports, who's doing what. Um, you'll see sometimes Google like if it's on internet, it must be true, right? It's bananas, <laughs> right? But you'll see some lenders say that we're the top VA lender, and um, and and. and in defense, just because you do the most doesn't mean you're the best, right? Because you might have a great marketing team and you do a lot, but you might not be great at it or the fees might be higher or the rates might be higher. I mean, I, I, love, I love teaching veterans on how to shop for a mortgage. It's pretty awesome. That's, that's important.
Well, we will be closing the show on some of that, so we'll we'll save that for a little bit. Um, but so back to your question, subsequent use just means you can use your VA loan a second, third, fourth, fifth time. Um, it all depends on your entitlement, whether you sold the previous property uh, or you didn't. And so there's some math there. It's it, it We could do a special on that someday, perhaps, because that's a deep dive. Sounds good to me. That's a deep dive. Um, and so funding fees relatively, yep. like what are we talking about? So for a veteran first time use, 100% financing, the funding fee is 2.3% of the loan amount. So on a $100,000 loan, the funding fee is $2,300. It's not an out-of-pocket cost to the veteran. It's financed into the loan, right? Okay. So if a veteran buys a $100,000 home, 100% financing, that funding fee will be one, you know, $2,300. So the loan amount would be $102,300. Okay. So that's the funding fee. And uh, the funding fee changes if the veteran so chooses to put a 5% down payment or a 10% down payment. Those funding fees will change. Um, they get lower. They get smaller because the, you have some skin in the game. That's something I wanted to ask you, but that's a couple of questions down the road. Um, you had you had made mention uh, the fact that I guess the rates for VA home loans are more preferable. Yeah, they're all they're much better. Like but what I mean by how many points are we? Talking well, about? I would say that generally they're typically, um, and again, so. You have to interview and you have to do some research on your lender, your mortgage professional, do your due diligence, shop around. Um, it's okay if you have 55 lenders, check your credit in a two to three week period. Don't ever let a mortgage guy tell you, oh, don't have anybody else check it. It's going to hurt your chances. VA has the most flexible credit guidelines out of any loan option out there in the United States. So if you want to have 50 lenders pull your credit in a one week period to get the best rate, then knock yourself out. Well, this is one of the things. So in a previous discussion you and I had, and I'm glad that you said that um, because I did not put this down as a question or for something you expand on anyway. Um, and that is the fact that you've told me before, correct me if I'm putting this wrong, but like the VA home loan is a, a story loan. Like it's- It is a story loan. Can you explain that for the audience? So this is where you'll, you know, if you're a really good seasoned practitioner of, that's what I like to call mortgage professionals that do this, that work in the VA channel often, the VA is a story loan where it, when you look at the VA handbook, we call the handbook, it's 26-7. That's the handbook where we have all the VA guidance on how to approve or credit underwrite a veteran, right? And they offer a lot of areas of ambiguity in there. And they give a lot of discretion to the lender to make the decision. The VA Home Loan Guarantee Division wants you guys, you men and women, to own homes and use this benefit. There's got to be some restrictions sometimes. There's some credit risk that we have to consider. So a VA Home Loan being a story loan means I can say, what did you do in the military? What was your MOS? What kind of awards did you get? Uh, meritorious unit citations, uh, training awards. So I look at the DD-214 and rip it out, all right? What were you doing? Uh, okay, I'll give you a perfect example, actually, just popped into my head. I helped a veteran out about a year and a half ago, Marine. He was, um, I believe it was an E6 or an E7, but he was in charge of all heavy weaponry for the entire platoon, uh, for the company, 100 and something men, men and women, right? He was a machine gunner. There's a machine gunner. There's no civilian machine gunning jobs out there. <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> right? So here's the deal. He gets out, he ETS is out, and he gets a job with this company as a as like a, as a manager, right? And the underwriter's like, mm, I don't know. He's had he hasn't been on the job one year yet. And that's another thing, too. A lot of lenders will be like, he's got to be on the job one year. Not necessarily be on the job one year. It's a story loan. Yes, it'll be difficult if you're 11 Bravo, 0311 coming out of the Marines, and now you become a carpenter. It's huff, It's hard for me to say that's stable and reliable employment, right? Because there's no skills there, really, unfortunately. Um, so this guy, uh, I said, well, listen, I go, all right, here's what we're going to do. Send me your DD-214, legible copy. We looked at it. And then I go, then send me your resume of what you did in the Marines. Because civilians like me aren't really great at interpreting what the each award ribbon is, what it means, the clusters, the stars. Like I noticed your car has a has a gold star. So like I had to look that up. I'm like, what does that mean? So, but when you look at 
that DD-214 of this individual, I was able to be like, oh, he was in charge of procurement, maintenance, personnel. That was his entire resume. It was like everything w about what he did was on his resume, which corresponded to his DD-214. Tons of management. Tons of management, exactly. So I, I, I then wrote up my own letter of explanation. Then I got a letter of explanation from the employer that was like, we're hiring this, this dude because of all of this. So the underwriter's like, absolutely. No problem. Story loan. We told the story of what this hero did while serving his country. And it wasn't just an E6 machine gunner coming out. If you play it like that, it's not, it's going to get denied. If you, if you sort of dive into the DD-214 and it's legitimately verified, we, we have a better chance. So it's a story loan. Uh, what happened with your foreclosure? What happened with your credit, uh, your, your, your repossession? Uh, why were you late this many times on a derogatory? Just closed a loan with a veteran, had three months of derogatory lights, dropped his credit down. He's like, Rick, I had a, I had a severe PTSD issue and I had, to get, I had to get committed for a little while. And he, he wanted to tell me, I'm like, ah, none of my business, bro. Not my business. I just need to know what happened here because I'm going to tell the underwriter. So just write up a letter. And uh, the underwriter was like, cool, I get that. Because sometimes if you have a lot of derogatory late payments in a 12 month period, it could be detrimental, right. but that was explainable story loan. So that you can tell a story. Interesting. Unlike Fannie Mae for civilians like me, Fannie and Freddie, the guidelines are the guidelines, Boop, black and white. You're either on this side or that side. There is no, there is no ambiguity. There's no gray area. And that's what VA does. They create the gray area that allows us to operate and help you men and women. So it sounds like there's a lot of benefits to using VA home loan. Uh, if I you're, mean, yeah, if you're a veteran and you use another loan, most likely it's because you were convinced or duped into doing it. You know, um, we can talk all day about how sellers and certain real estate agents are anti VA. It happens across the country. It's a horrible thing. Irritates the you know what out of me. Why? Because it's more work or something? Or? No, they just deny veterans because they think the VA loan's a bad option. And I shoot them down every time with data, facts, and stats on why it isn't. And they still don't get it. And so they, what they'll do is they'll actually go ahead and say like, no, we're not accepting those offers because it's VA. I just, I just read a comment on one of my Facebook groups in Washington State. The listing agent said, we're not taking it because it's VA. That's, that's a discriminatory action in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts because you veterans are a protected class. Yeah. Under Massachusetts General Law Chapter 150B, 151B. Oh, you're in New Hampshire? Yeah. You're not a protected class up there. But Massachusetts <laughs> veterans, you are. <laughs> 151B, Section 7. That's where it is in our statute. I have to memorize it because I use it a lot with certain real estate and mortgage professionals. So what are some of the numbers you, that you're referring to, the data, as far as? So um, one of the companies that I know, closed 27,000 VA loans last year. They closed 77 loans a day. That's a lot. Jeez. Average FICO score was 741. Average liquid assets was 31,000. Average debt to income ratio was 40.1%. Those are conventional high quality credit guidelines. And most of those loans, purchase loans, were 100% financing. And VA has the best performance. VA's VA home loans have equal to, if not slightly worse, foreclosure rates, delinquency rates, and seriously serious delinquency rates in the mortgage history. There is no, there is no quantifiable data that says it's a it's a worse loan over a conventional loan. And the fact that it's a VA loan with 100% financing, and as I just explained, the average assets, right? 100% financing means the veteran doesn't have any money in the down payment, not because they can't because they don't have to. They earn the benefit. You don't have to put your money down. And then it pisses me off when sellers are like, can I say that? Is that bad? <laughs> no, you is, can, that, is that all right? You yeah. can say it pisses you <laughs> off, yeah. It, it, it really does. And I go, well, well, he doesn't have any skin in the game. No, he doesn't have to have skin in the game. He served my country for 14 years. That's enough skin for me, right? Or four years or whatever it was. Or he's a disabled veteran, there's enough skin. He's got enough skin in the game. He doesn't have to put a down payment so what's the deal, right? Um, and the data is out there and it's just hard to get that 
so things like this is great for me to try to advocate for all of you and try to hopefully a real estate agent or a, or a mortgage professional watches this and is like, well, wow, all this data is, is it's, it's verifiable. Like VA just shared the annual uh, data from 2020. Their average FICO score was 727. Average DTI was 41. Average liquid assets was like 23,000, 25,000. DTI debt to income. Debt, yeah, exactly. Okay. Debt to income ratio, right? So they're like, oh, 100% financing, their debt to income ratio must be high, right? There's never been any studies done and there's no data to support the argument that a down payment correlates to a closed transaction. None. I don't I don't think, I, I don't know. I don't want to put everybody into a box because that's a horrible thing to do. Uh, but for the most part, most of the veterans that I know, um, they're like, okay, these are here are my responsibilities. I adhere to my responsibilities. Like it will be the very last thing that I don't pay is my mortgage or something like that. You know, it's, it would have to be something really detrimental going on in their life to keep them from falling through on. You're talking about culture and there's, a, there's, there's something about the military community. The culture is different than the non-military civilians. Um, veterans almost always find a way to pay that housing debt or pay the rent. You know, not so much, <clears throat> excuse me, not so much if they're on base, of course, because if they're on base housing and they do get a BAH, it's an automatic, they, it's just auto taken out of their account. So they pay the housing debt on the base all the time. But when it comes to a veteran active duty that are, that are out there um, in transitioned out, they pay their mortgage, they pay their rent and they do so religiously. And I think that's a culture thing. And um, I, I, it's, no, it's it's very uncommon for me working with a veteran to see a history of non-payment on mortgage or rent. It's very, very unusual. Very unusual. But the culture piece is what I try to, I, I think that's what differentiates the, the high quality product, the high quality loans that are VA. I, I attribute that largely in part to the culture of the VA uh, of the of the service member and their their will their their willingness willingness to pay the debt and their unwillingness to be late. I see it a lot. They pay. Um, so I realize uh, before we go any further, we should probably talk about how to apply for a VA home loan. Yes, applying. Stay off the internet. Just do not go to. I would do not. There's. I can't say names, but there are certain. Um, websites that all they are, they advertise to be VA, but they're lead aggregators. They're just generate leads. And next thing you know, you'll get bombarded with 55 phone calls because they sell those leads to all these lenders that buy these leads, right? So first thing I would do is if you're going to apply for VA home loan, ask around amongst your brothers and sisters and see if they know a lender that they had a good experience with, number one. That's that's a, the best referral is a, is a is a personal referral. No, word of mouth is always it's always the best, right? Stay off the internet. Don't go there. Um, I would I would say it's different nowadays, but you you don't necessarily have to be local. Like I've helped veterans in Florida and Texas, and we give them top notch service. I'm not local, but I understand the benefit. And but process. you have to be licensed there. Correct. Yeah. So you ask first your friends, who'd you use? Oh, I use Johnny Jojo down the street. Okay. That's great. You reach out to them. You want to right away say, I'm a veteran and I want to use my VA loan benefit. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You tell that person I'm using VA. And if they go, well, you know, then just walk out. If they, if they start to go, you know, there's other programs that might be better for you. Just leave because that person is not a practitioner and that person does not get it. And so therefore that person shouldn't be helping you. Boop. End of story. Assuming you get a good one, you, you sit down, interview them. How many VA loans you do? How does your lender do them? Uh, do you service your own loans? Do you, do you sell servicing? Do you sell the loan to other lenders? Ask these questions. How long have you been in the business? What do you? Uh, can you explain some of those? What do you mean by service your own loan? So lenders... Um, there's a couple couple different models of lending out there. You have uh, lenders that will aggregate millions of dollars of loans in a month, close them all up, and then they sell them um, to other servicers. And they the way that they make their money is by 
bundling up or what we call pooling, $100 million of loans, they sell that to the servicer, and now this lender is able to go originate another $100 million worth of loans. It's kind of like a big revolving credit card, right? Okay. Other lenders will service their loans for a long time. In other words, the lender you close with, they end up paying, you end up paying them. That's how the company that I work for at the moment, they service their own loans. They, they do so for a very, very long time. Um, each model is good. There's nothing wrong. There's one, it depends on your personal preference, you know? Um, some people are like, I really don't care who, who I pay. It's I pay it online. So it doesn't matter whether it goes to company A, B, C, or D. Sometimes you have some issues with the tax and insurance escrows when they sell the mortgage to the new lender. There could be a little bit of an issue sometimes, but it's still a great model. Um, and the other model where the lender services it forever is it's nice because that that individual that helped you with that loan is your point of contact for the servicing questions on taxes or insurance. Though it's good. So, the, you know, that's the two main models. But when you're interviewing your, your mortgage professional, it's a good question to ask. Um, so you can kind of get as, as much data out there as possible for you to make your decision. And you ask about interest rates, fees, um, costs, timelines. You know, are you, can I use my own attorney? Do, do I have to use your attorney? Uh, but, I, it, you know, I would spend my time grilling the mortgage professional on how many VA loans you do. Can you show me how many VA loans you do? I mean, I, I can show you how many VA loans I did in my computer at my, my office. I can bring up my, my closed pipeline for the year and show you like, you know, we're doing X. They should, should be able to do the same. Um, because you want to work with someone that's experienced in it. Because again, back to what we talked about a few minutes ago, if that veteran has somewhat of a checkered credit history, employment instability, bouncing around a little bit, some issues, you want someone that can write the story to help you get approved. And so if you're not, if you're working with an inexperienced individual, that'd be, that'll be tougher. So ask around, find a good lender through your, your partners, your peers, your brothers and sisters, coworkers, and then start there. And then, if you want to do some shopping on your own, that's good too. Then you have three or four different options. You can compare them. It's important. And so now I've found Bob down the road. Who's yeah, gonna, Bob. Who's going to help me set up my mm -hmm. or apply for a loan. How does that process work? Really, the VA is the easiest loan to underwrite out there because of the wide range of gray or ambiguity in the VA. Uh, so generally for me, um, VA is very much uh, about work stability. Um, we typically need uh, your W-2s, most recent 30 days of your pay stubs, one month bank statement, your DD-214, copy of your unexpired driver's license. That's all I need. Now, there are various types of people um, and professions and jobs, and, and there's a lot of different levels of income requirements that we have uh, for documentation purposes, depending on if you're self-employed, and we don't want to get into that, like, that's deep weeds. Like, if you're self-employed, you're sole proprietor, 1120S, 1120, 1065, those are corporate returns we have to get, and it gets a little, gets a little crazy. So, but for today, if you're a basic wage earner, you work for the Department of Veteran Affairs, you get a W-2 at the end of the year, you get paid 40 hours for the week, or I know you work more than that. Um, then we just need the W-2s in the last two years, the 30 days of your pay stubs, one month bank statement, that's pretty cool. Non just, just one? One month bank statement. Non-VA requires two months. VA is only one month bank statement. And um, and then unexpired driver's license and your, your, your service your verification of service. So if you're active duty, we just need an LES statement. Active duty service members are the easiest to approve. That's, you. all you need is one month bank statement, an ID and an LES statement and you're done. Now you can get a full commitment on that. Boop, they're easy. PCS transfers are the simplest form to approve. Veterans when they get out because they're different jobs that they have, bonus, commission, overtime. We have to, we have to quantify all that, we have to calculate all that. So it takes a little bit more, but. Very easy to approve VA loans. It's not hard. And so now I've gone through the process. I've filled out the paperwork. I have my uh, certificate of eligibility and all that, right? Um, Which you can get by way yourself. 
Yeah, on e benefits. Well, I that's I would recommend as a veteran get your own certificate of eligibility before you you even go see a lender. And why is that? Um, I, some lenders we've we've heard of problems where some lenders, some mortgage professionals that are inexperienced with VA approve or pre qualify a veteran, send them out shopping, and wait till the last minute to get the certificate of eligibility. And then one of two things happens. One, the veteran does have a COE, but it takes seven, eight days to get it because they're in the system, might take longer. Or- Like they serve pre-digital era. Pre-digital, or they actually don't have the certificate of eligibility. They don't have the eligibility because maybe they were a reserve component and they did five years instead of six and they didn't have any orders under Title 10. So now they're not a veteran and they wouldn't get the VA home loan. Oh, wait a minute, all right. Okay, you just dropped the bomb. All right, so was, what what are the requirements for someone that served in the National Guard or Reserve? Oh, don't go to the National Guard today. That 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 law <laughs> <laughs> that that law changed January fifth of this year. That is a wow, National Guard. So they haven't even written the policy on it yet. Really, they're still interpreting. Probably <sighs> the 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 law. We'll do another show on that. The law was passed through Congress. It was rushed. Um, I've actually reached out to the adjutant, gen the adjutant general of the National Guard here um, to have a conversation about educating. I've worked, I'm, I'm talking with the VSO's uh, agency, the Mass Veterans Service uh, Veterans Service Officers Agency here, the association. It's a, it's a it's big, it's big for National Guard. Um, we definitely got to get a show on that one because there's probably thousands and thousands of National Guard members now in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that are eligible for a VA loan that weren't on January 4th, and they are now on January 6th. Interesting. All yeah. right, well, there you go. We'll have another we'll follow-up yeah, show that, yeah, later we will, this we'll, year. That'll be sooner than later because that's huge. I had Me and my team just had a meeting with the Department of VA Loan Guarantee policy heads about five weeks ago on this, four weeks ago on this. And to give you some sort of perspective on this issue, They've only issued about 100, 100 and so COEs on this particular new federal law because they're working through policy. They haven't been able to issue the policy on how it's it's coming out. But So a reservist, I can talk about reservists. All right, let's cover <laughs> reservists then. Reservists, you got to have six consecutive six years of qualifying service. And so generally you get your, your year of qualifying service when you do your one week in a month, two to more weeks, a year of AT. You meet the criteria, that's one credible year of service. You need six credible years, and then you're considered by federal law to be a veteran, and you would have access to the VA loan benefit. If a reservist <clears throat> during his six years was deployed under US Code Title 10, Operation Enduring Freedom, Inherent Resolve, Gothic Serpent, all these that you guys served under, if they did 90 consecutive days, they are now a veteran, regardless of how many years of reserve time that they have. So I've helped a lot of reservists buy houses, been in the reserves for three years, but had a deployment to Iraq, Afghanistan, Djibouti, uh, wherever it was under Title 10. That's fine. Sometimes we have a problem though, is you have reservists <clears throat> that didn't do six years, or well, they think they did. I did four years of reserve and two years of IRR, inactive ready reserve. So they go to an inexperienced mortgage professional and say, yep, I served six years in reserves. Mortgage professional doesn't get the certificate of eligibility, pre-qualifies them on a VA loan, sends them out shopping, gets under contract week before. This is true. This happens every, every week, someplace in the US, this happens. I kid you not. Next thing you know, they're, where's the COE? Where's the COE? Where's the COE? They reach out to VA, oh no, no, no. He had four years of reserves and two years of IRR. Who's, I mean, the veteran might lose their escrow deposit on that house. They might've given up their, 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 their residential unit, their rental before, they, make, they could be homeless. They don't have a place to stay. First thing that you do is you get your certificate of eligibility. Get your COE folks, first thing. And, the lender, we can do that. So like um, VA has created the automatic COE system. It's called ACE. And lenders have the ability to go in. I just need your date of birth, 
and your social security number. I can go into the system for VA, plug that in, and about 83% of the time, get an instant COE. That's all we need. Um, there's a simple form that you have to fill out for us to give us permission. It's the 26 1880 form that gets you your, that, that allows us to request it. It's like your authorization to request benefits. But you shouldn't be out there shopping for a house on a VA loan if you don't have a COE in your hand. So as the veteran, you get it yourself. Now you can be like, you, now you'll be like, you're not dependent on that, on that lender to get it for you. You got it. You'd be like, hey, Paul. I want to use you as a lender. Oh, great. Let me get your COE. No, no, I got my COE. What's your rate, fees, system, processing? How experienced are you? I don't like you. I got my COE. I'm going to go over here to this lender. Ask that person, Rick, Joe, whatever. Gives you a little bit more control. So if, you are, if you're able to navigate e-benefits and get it yourself, get it yourself. And usually with e-benefits, you do, I, I, I'm, I'm not in there. So you do your process and they just usually email you the PDF of your COE pretty quickly. So do that. So you've gone through all this. Now you're at the time where you're going to actually going to go shopping and everything <sighs> else. You find your dream home and uh, put in an offer. The offer is accepted. How long does it take to close? A 30 days. That's it? That's it. Yeah. We, I mean, I mean, is that like record time or no. is that's just... My like fastest normal? VA loan I ever closed was, was uh, 15, 16 days. That was not in the volume time that we're dealing with right now. So you have the appraisal. We can talk about the appraisal, uh, property conditions, minimum property requirements. That's another. We can talk about that in here whenever you want. Um, because of the volume in the industry nationally, nationally, there um, it could sometimes take the appraiser ten to fifteen days to get it to get it back to you. The appraisal report. So generally, thirty days is more than enough time to close a VA loan. Because the standards for so this is one of the things. Um, maybe we should just dive into. I mean, we won't do a deep dive, but one of the things that people need to understand is that you're not going to use a VA loan to buy a fixer upper. No, you're not. You're buying a turnkey home. Not even turnkey. So turnkey is. So the real estate industry is is notorious for using terminology interchangeably, and they, they use, it doesn't have to be turnkey. Like I've had veterans buy homes like the 1960-something Cape that is, you know, pink ceiling, you know, uh, green carpets, and it looks like a lot of work needs to be done to it, but it doesn't have any minimum property requirement violations. So, and it's fine. And I just did a webinar with the Department of VA Loan Guarantee, the Regional Loan Center out of Cleveland, the chief valuation officer out there, Marty Finland's a good friend of mine. He's a personal friend of mine. He runs that. He's the guy that says yay or nay on these appraisals. Or oftentimes, he's the big boss out in Cleveland. Um, and we had this big webinar talking about this with real estate professionals. And we're like, the biggest issues that veterans will run into here in New England is peeling paint and missing handrails. God strike me dead. That's it. A missing handrail going down to the basement is an issue. Peeling paint, interior, exterior, on any structure of the of the property, shed, fence, deck, soffit, sills, porches, has to be addressed. So, but that's Anything generally Anything on the property, period. Yes, yes, any structure on the parcel. Now, if you have a shed that's like dilapidated, fallen down, you as a veteran could say to the seller, fix and repaint that. They could say, no, I don't want to. Then you could say, is it okay if I tear it down? Yeah. Get permission from the seller, go out there and knock the thing down. Who cares? I've had that happen before. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I've had veterans go out to houses that they don't own, but they really wanted to buy it. And the seller had a shed that was like peeling paint. And that was all that we had to get cleared up was this, it was the peeling paint issue. The seller's like, nope, not going to do it. I'm like, you know, it's kind of, a, kind of a donkey move. I mean, it was like, it's cheap. It was like a half hour a day, you know? So I said to the listing agent, I go, hey, is it okay if my veteran goes out there and takes care of it? And she goes, oh, VA won't allow that. I go, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Trust me when I tell you. It's okay. We can do this. She's like, yeah, the seller's fine with it. So my veteran, who's a Marine, by the way, <laughs> he took out his, his, his boom box, his stereo. He brought a cooler full of beer out there. Him and his buddies sanded it, scraped it, repainted it like this 
like god awful bright neon blue color because they were going to freaking knock it down and once he closed the week later but it was we can do stuff like that so turnkey is a strong word it just can't be missing it can't be violating any of the minimum property requirements so you can't buy a place that needs work it needs to be yeah you know if you're buying a house that's run down dilapidated holes in the wall you know you want to put some sweat equity in it, it's not going to work although there is a va renovation loan out there that it, that will allow you to buy a house that needs a little bit of work and then you can do a renovation loan with it yeah maybe that's another podcast too yeah we can yeah that's a cool one i never even knew about that yeah it's a va rental loan well um we offer it um it was temporarily suspended during the pandemic i do believe they've rescinded that circular and i believe it's back up and running and um Generally, the lenders set the limits on what renovations they'll allow, well, uh, the limit, the, the money-wise, right? Most of the time, the VA renos are designed to mitigate property issues that otherwise would cause the loan to be denied, right? It's not designed to build an addition or, you know, uh, go up or redo it. You could probably redo a kitchen. Um, they tend to limit the money on reno to about twenty-five to 35000 so if a veteran wanted to buy a house, still 100% finance. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and what ends up happening is the rental costs, um, the appraised value needs to appraise out, of course. It, it <clears> needs you know. to exceed the amount being spent. Right. I mean, if you're buying a house for $300,000, you are going to do $20,000 worth of work to it. It's got to appraise at three twenty dollars or more, which they generally will because you're going to be doing some work to it. But yeah, so if you had a house that was terrible peeling paint on the exterior and it's like a $15,000 job. We get the bid from the contractor. We send it to the appraiser. What is the after improved value? If the entire property, the condition is upgraded and if it comes back at whatever, the value and the value plus the renovation cost, you're good. Yeah, it's good stuff. All right. So kind of went through most of the process or all the process yeah once you i mean once you once you found the house the one thing i want to touch upon and i'm not sure if you have it on here is that th this is a big this is a big issue stumbling block for a lot of realtors in, in in massachusetts and other parts of the country is that the veteran even though you're buying the house with no down payment you need money for a deposit it's very important what do you what do you mean why so the real estate process the transactional process in most states are this you find a house, I want to buy that house. It's kind of like layaway. You got to give the seller some money, escrow, a deposit. A so show of good faith kind of thing. To take it off the market. So you do have to have some money. I mean, I've done that with a car before. I'm like, hey, I, I, I got to go talk to my bank. It'd be two days, whatever, but here's, you know. Yeah, so that is where some veterans, uh, there are some veterans that, that are in a, 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 in a tough position liquid-wise, liquid asset-wise, where they don't have that asset available. So that makes the deposit very small. And sometimes that is a reason for a seller to deny the offer. But we try to employ other techniques to get them to accept the offer. Um, sometimes a veteran will give me authorization to release all info on him, how much money he has in the bank, his credit score, his debt to income ratio, all that to get the offer one. I'll write a letter of explanation. The veteran will write a letter. I'm so-and-so, a disabled veteran, served my country, love your house, blah, 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 blah. Um, talk to the agents like, hey, listen, this veteran only has 7,000 in his bank. That's it. He's giving you five of that. He's not walking. Like that's a... That's his good faith offer. It's pretty much all his money. It's pretty much or all his money. money. So, and that is, so it's important. So if you're a veteran watching this and you literally have zero dollars in your bank, I would recommend not buying a house right now. Just be financially responsible. Save some money up so you have a little bit for a deposit, nest egg. You're going to buy that house. Something could go wrong, a heater, a window. Uh, something needs to get fixed. You don't want to go into debt on credit cards. Message you up here. So have some money saved up. And I and I typically tell veterans, if you're looking to buy a house, you should start about 18 months out getting ready for that process. Like if you're looking to buy a house, you know you're not ready now. You would talk to someone like me. How do I get ready? What do I got to do? 
We do a quick triage. Your credit's fine. You have no money in the bank. And are you ready to buy? No, I'm still in my lease for seven months, eight months. Great. This is what you need to do. Save up this. Do that. Don't do this. And you'll be ready. Okay. It works. Sometimes I can take a horse to water, but I can't make you drink. You know what I mean? Well, it's it's kind of one of those funny things. I mean, it's um, I've had this discussion with a lot of veterans that I've served with. And one of the things that we miss terribly about being in the military is that there's not an actual objective or mission every day. And so you take yeah. some you take someone that is geared towards that or understands that concept and says, hey, here's your mission. Here's your goals. Hit these goals and you'll get, you know, the, the pot of money at the end of the rainbow. One of my best stories I tell all the time was from 2000. I think it was it started for me in 2015. This young veteran was in school, 100 percent disabled, um, was receiving uh, Social Security as well at the time and BAH for post 11 GI Bill. And he came and he wanted to buy a house. Went through a terrible divorce. Uh, we sat down, his credit score was like a 560. Couldn't do anything at the time. We saw some collections and we just did that. We set up mission objectives. We go, this is what we're gonna do. This is this is how you're gonna do it. Do you need to live off your entire BAH from, from your post 9-11 GI? He goes, no, I don't need all that. I go, okay, time to, time to tighten the belt buckle a little bit. We're gonna use half of that every month to pay off the nine, ten thousand dollars in collections that you were left with when you got a Dear John letter from your ex-wife when you were serving my country and overseas in Iraq. And that's a true story. When you got home from Iran, I'm sure you know hundreds of veterans that's that happened to, right? When he got home, he literally came home to an empty house and a stack of bills on his table, all collections. And it was almost like twelve to fifteen thousand dollars in collections. And she whew, skipped town. And a lot of those debts were his. So I said, here's what we're going to do. For the next six to nine months, you're going to use half of your BAH, whatever it was, 1600 bucks or something. And you're going to pay these off. Yep. You're going to live off this. You're going to keep paying your rent. Yep. You're going to pay your rent with a check. I don't want you to use a money order. I don't want you to use cash. Because you need a trail. I want you to be a big boy, write the check out, <laughs> and physically hand it to the person. Yeah. He's like, you got it, Rick. No problem. All right, cool. Comes back uh, 12 months later, 13 months later and goes, let's do this. I'm like, okay. He brought his credit score up from, and he didn't have to pay anybody to do it either. He didn't have to, I'm not a credit repair guy. There are some good companies out there that I, I could recommend that do that sort of thing. But this guy, he did it on his own. He paid off all his collections. It was zeroed out. He got the secure credit card. He worked on it. He paid his bills. He came to me, he had a 637 or a 647 FICO score, found a beautiful condo in Salem. I got the condo VA approved in two weeks. He closed and owns a house now. But it took 12 to 15 months to do that. Mission objective, set, we put him on task, and he did it. Best story ever. That's a good story. It's a true story too. If you'd like, I would share his name, but I won't share it to him. He's a great guy. He's a dear friend of mine too now to, to this day he's a dear friend of mine so seeing that you brought it up credit scores um is there like a hard fast line that the va has that all right veteran has to hit this number in order for us to so you just said it va has va has no credit score requirement va never established a credit score requirement in the handbook and that's where you'll hear we are here some inexper inexperienced mortgage professionals say va has a minimum fico score of 620 or 640, or 660, or 580. VA never established a credit score. Guys, VA never set a credit score requirement when they created the benefit in 1944. The lender who lends the money and accepts the risk of the loan sets the credit score. Makes sense. Right? Yeah. So some lenders are 580, and there's one or two that'll go to 500. Most, Jeez. yeah, that's a- that's it's gonna a, be a high interest rate. It is higher significantly. I mean, there's a lot of risk for that. I mean, right. uh, there is when you're in the FICO scores in that range, the, there's a lot of risk. So you're going to pay for that. You know, um, most lenders are at 620. So, but some will be 640, 660. So that's again, do your due diligence as a veteran interviewing your lender. 
What's your minimum FICO score? Will you go below 620? Are you at a 580? If I have a 585, what do I have to do to get a house? Because you have to, in your brain, know, just because you got a, if the lender works in a 580 range, but you're a 581, you still might not get the house because there's a, the credit qualifying process could be other things on the credit that are going to deny you from getting a loan. So we've had good success helping veterans in the 590 plus range. 580 gets a little tight. They usually have some pretty significant derogatories that are on there that take a lot of uh, you know work to, to get mitigated. But so, you know, there is no minimum credit score by VA. The lenders will establish the minimum credit score for the for the uh, their loan. So I know we we covered this very topic, uh, the question I'm about to bring up right now in a previous video, but I think it's important to reiterate. Okay, and that is the fact that just because you have a mobile app on your phone that tells you what your credit score is, oh. doesn't mean that Please. is your credit score. It, yeah, yeah. Do that and what credit score do do they actually look at for mortgages? So there are eight different algorithms that create a credit score, a FICO score, right? And what you're looking at on your mobile app, Credit Karma, Credit Wise, um, credit reporting services via various credit cards. I mean, I can say this because it's factual. It's not, it's not derogatory towards the entities, but they are not using a mortgage-related FICO algorithm. So they call them FICOs one through eight. And the lending industry uses FICO 4. Credit Wise, Credit Karma, those use FICO 8, FICO 7. Those are more conserv those are not as conservative as FICO 4. It is not uncommon for me to have a veteran come in and say, I looked at Credit Karma, my credit score is a 640, and then I pull it and it's a 595 or a 605. It's different. So does it give you an idea? Yes. It'll give you a ballpark, a huge ballpark. But you want to, again, this kind of goes back to when I was talking about preparation and tasks and objectives. If you're looking to buy a house 18 months from now, or you want to start, you start now 18 months or 12 months out, go to a mortgage professional, have a hard inquiry done, get it on a FICO 4, see what your credit score is. If you go ahead today and you check your credit and it's a 700, 720, 730, 690, okay. And then for the next 12 to 14 months, you pay your bills on time, you keep your balances low, uh, you're not late on anything, your credit's gonna stay the same. It's not gonna get worse. It's gonna get better, right? So um, obviously if you're late on something, you, you forget something, it's gonna change it. But if you go 12 to 14, 18 months out, that hard inquiry, you won't even notice the difference when I go to official, officially check it to get you pre-qualified. It doesn't, it won't impact you at all. It will be gone. Um, the, uh, the effect of the hard inquiry will be gone by the time you go to a mortgage professional to, to check again. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so it's good to have, <clears throat> good to have an idea, but, and it's, there's a, there's a sort of a range of concern, I would say. If you're looking at Credit Karma or Credit Wise and you're a 795 FICO score, you're all right for a VA loan. <laughs> right? Because there's you, no way you're. You, you, you're not like, yeah, you're a six, you're going to be a 720, 730, 740, whatever. You're going to be fine. Right. If you're a Credit Karma and you're monitoring it and it's a 630, 640, you might be below 500. You could be below, it could be below 590, 580, 610, 605. Depends. So Probably that's well, why. 600 rather. Yeah, yeah. It, could, it could be. So you don't know. So that's why there's a wide range of concern. Um, higher end, you're less concerned. Lower end, more concerned. But yeah, the mobile app helps, but it's not a, shouldn't be using that as a deciding factor as to whether it's the right time or not to buy a house. I think that's a good way to end that one. It is. <laughs> yeah, it's a good way. Yeah. Um. Let's see here. What's next? What do I have here on my list? This is great. I love getting, I love when just questions get just thrown at me and because it, it, it just gets the brain running and I can just die, I can digress in certain directions. It's awesome. So, um, what types of properties can veterans buy? 
So anything under five units, they can four units or less. So they can buy a single family. They can buy a condo. Wait a minute, what? I could buy a four family? Owner occupied, 100% financing, no down payment. Yep. Multifamily. Yep. Wow. Little, little catch to multis. You can't, if you don't have landlord experience, if you don't have landlord experience, then you really can't use the rental income to help you qualify. Interesting. So there is a workaround to that, but it, it, it adds a little bit more complexity to the transaction. If you're a veteran, you're looking to buy a four family, you have no landlord experience. If you sign a 12 month property management contract with a property management company, you can then use the rental income to qualify, but a couple caveats, I have to debt you for the cost of the contract, 100 bucks a month, 200 bucks a month, whatever it's gonna be, mm -hmm. and I can use 75% of the rental income to help you qualify. You need six months reserves when you close. Now a reserve is one month mortgage payment. So if that mortgage payment is three grand, after you close, the day of closing, I need to know that in your bank account, there's 18,000 plus for six months reserves. So adds a couple layers of extra if you're gonna try to use a rental income. If you make enough money where you, let's say this four family, the mortgage payment's $3,500 and you qualify on your own, like you make enough money, credit, debt, whatever to qualify, you don't need anything. No reserves, don't use the rental income, done. I just helped a Boston police officer, a Boston firefighter. He bought a two family in, uh, in Boston. It was $990,000 and he qualified for the full amount. 100% financing, two family, no down payment, bananas. Like 30 year fixed mortgages in the twos, crazy. So multi, so single families, two, three, four units, manufactured homes, um, that's like a mobile home, double wide, it's gotta be a double wide. Um, condos, big, mis oh, big, big mis uh, misconception about condos. What do you mean? Oh, the condos take too long. Um, What's takes it to get them approved within VA? So VA requires condominium associations to be approved by the Department of VA Loan Guarantee. Aren't most of them? No. Oh, no. really? Yeah, I've I've helped I've helped almost a hundred condos in and around New England get approved in the last seven to eight years because we have it. We we just have it down to a science. We know exactly what we need, and we just here's a, I give a list to the listing agent. I go, this is what I need. They get it to us, whoop, we send it over to VA Loan Guarantee, Cleveland Regional Loan Center, and you're good. Last condo we got approval last week, six business days. It's pretty quick. Yeah, yeah, so it, it, it's not it's not hot. I tell real estate agents this all the time, and they're like, what? Yeah, six days. They go, my lender said 90. I'm like, I don't know what they're talking about. Six days. Yeah, I mean, if, if I'm a seller and somebody tells me, oh, it's 90 days for this person to potentially be able to buy it. I'm not, ta I'm not taking the offer. No, I'm going somewhere else. But if you tell me it's six days, then maybe I wait. So, you know, condos are a great opportunity. Cond some condos could be a great opportunity, an affordable opportunity for some veterans to purchase a home. And funny, that story that I told, like I said, the story I told you about that veteran who we helped over a 15 month period, he was able between no job, 100% disabled, Social Security, and um, I, I always forget this. He he receives special adapt combat pay. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. He received that as well. Um, he qualified on just that income alone, and he bought this like condo for 220000 And so condos could be a great, great opportunity. There used to be two... Um, Sort of kicker, there's three kickers. There used to be three kickers for, for denying a condo. One is litigation. If the condo's going through litigation, someone's suing them, VA is probably not going to approve it. Um, it would depend on the type of litigation. So if there's any lawsuits, bad. If the condo has a first right of refusal provision in the condom in documents, right? That means the condo association, I don't know how this is not discriminatory. The condo association, this is very common in Florida, actually. The condo association board of directors can deny or approve the sale. 
no, we don't want that person in here. Oh, we do want that person. First right of refusal. That seems, how do you, how do you not violate fair lending, fair housing in ECOA? Well, not so much ECOA, but fair lending and fair housing. How, how do you not violate it? That is, a, what's the monitors? And how do you monitor that? To me, it's bananas. So first right of refusal is a no. The third that used to be was a deed restriction for rental. In other words, it would say, Paul Corbett, who owns this condo, cannot rent his unit. If that's the condo doc said that, the VA would deny it. That was recently changed back in February or March of this year. Now, if the veteran signs an affidavit in a hold harmless that says, I acknowledge that there's a leasing restriction and I'm okay with it, the VA will, will issue the waiver, which is cool. So single, multi, condo, manufactured home, can't do commercial or five units or more. No second homes. No investment owner properties. It's got to be owner occupied. And, and, vet, I, and the, I also I also learned you can't buy homes outside of the country. Um, Guam. Well, that's a U.S. Yeah, you yeah you can't buy anything outside the country. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Virgin Islands, Guam, Puerto Rico. Those you, places yeah. you can definitely you, buy. You good? Yeah, because I've talked to the director of veteran affairs. I've talked to the director of veteran services down in uh, St. Thomas. Patrick, um, great guy, super awesome guy. Love his accent too. Um, we might be doing some educational work down there, but yeah, he's got a lot of veterans down there. I didn't even know that they could really use it. St. Croix, St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico. Works good. St. Croix sounds like a great place to buy a house. I think St. Croix is a great place for me to do an educational event down there for about a, <laughs> <laughs> for about a week. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'd love to do that. Um, oh, so and, the, and the veteran must occupy the property within 60 days of closing. That's a guideline. So if you buy a house, you have to occupy it within 60 days. Yeah, but what if you want to renovate it or something? Or You have 60 days to do that. I mean, if it's going to go a little over 60, VA is not going to give you a hard time, but you can't buy it and renovate it for nine months and the VA would get ticked off about that one. Um, so can someone have more than one VA home loan at a time? Yeah. I mean, you kind of touched on that we already. We touched upon it a little bit, yeah. This is... Um, this gets, this is where a lot of veterans, a lot of real estate agents, a lot of mortgage professionals get a little confused because the guidelines just changed with the Blue Water Navy Act in January of 2020. The, the, the number of homes that a veteran can buy is directly tied to the amount of entitlement that they have and the county in which they're moving to. So this is where it gets confusing. Veteran buying his first home has no loan limit. Boop. Bought a $160,000 home outside of Fort Benning, Georgia. Good, right? Lives there, comes up on orders. He's transferring, he's PCSing up to Hanscom in Bedford, Massachusetts, okay? Uh, Hanscom Air Force Base. Because he has an outstanding VA loan, he has outstanding entitlement that has been assigned to that particular property. Since that property will be retained, as an investment property, or he'll rent it out, he's moving up to Boston. We now then have to use the county loan limits to quantify the maximum 100% financing the veteran is allowed to apply for. So it gets a little confusing. Oh, I, I kind of get what you're throwing out there. So, it's, so actually, it really sounds like it's... Um uh, not picking on any state or anything like that, but it sounds like it's probably really good to move from down south to the north, but not from the north to the south. That is a that is actually one of the best statements that a non mortgage professional has ever made about the VA loan. You are hundred percent right. If you're because you won't have any gap, you won't have any entitlement remaining. If you're buying, if you're in a high cost county like Essex, Suffolk, Middlesex County, what's the I know what's the county, uh, uh, Norfolk, parts of Bristol, um, those are high cost counties. The high cost county VA loan limit is seven twenty four two fifty here. It's, <laughs> it's five forty, I believe it's five forty eight two fifty in in like Worcester County. So you're right. If you're a, a colonel and you have an expensive home here in Bedford, Mass, and then your new orders come up and you're going down to Georgia, all your entire, if you've got a $700,000, $600,000 home, this is a wild example. 
all your entitlements gone for the most part. You won't have any more entitlement remaining when you go to Georgia unless you request a one-time restoration of entitlement. And in order to do that, the colonel would have to refinance the property in Bedford, Massachusetts out of VA in the conventional while he's still in it. Once that's done, request a one-time restoration of entitlement and then he could buy another house with no down payment. So, it, so by restoration though, you mean, so like if I wanted to go out, wait a minute, let's see here. So if I want to use my loan multiple times, yeah, right, but I retain the property that I use the loan on. First time. The yep. first time. Mm -hmm. Then, so basically I cannot use VA home loan to accumulate investment properties. Correct. Like I can't go out every year and buy a no, new one. No, you can't. So the guy, it's funny, it's good, you know, um, you own a home in you own a home in Georgia. You transfer up to Boston. You said, you know what? I wanted to have 100% financing in a high cost county area. So before you left Georgia, you refinanced your house to a conventional, and then you requested a one time restoration of entitlement through the VA loan guarantee. So it's restored. Your entitlement's restored. You bought a seven hundred thousand dollar home here in Bedford. No down payment. You're good. So to your point, all of a sudden this veteran, this this veteran was like, wait a minute, I can get other properties. Let's try this again. So now I'm leaving Mass and I'm going to go to Michigan. If he tries to go request a one-time restoration of entitlement, to do that, he's got to sell both properties before they'll restore the entitlement. What? Gotcha. <laughs> That's crazy. So it's not designed... But the the most I've seen is I saw a veteran with three properties and they had VA loans on all three of them, because the one that he the first one he bought he bought for like seventy two grand. So the, the, in, oh, the so he just had enough entitlement left to correct keep going. He was like I think this one was um he was in Georgia, small house. Then he went to North Carolina, small house, and then he came up to Boston, and this is before the the market appreciation went bananas. Then he came to Boston or he came to our high cost county and was able to buy a, like a $413,000 house with no down payments. You had three. Can you use a VA home loan to refinance okay. or refinance? A, I mean, you already talked about it, but refinance an actual VA home loan. Yeah, VA will allow you to refinance up to 90% of the value of your home, whereas conventional financing stops at 80. VA issued a sweeping number of changes pertaining to the VA cash out refinance program in 2019 because of a lot of loan officers and lenders that were equity stripping veterans across the United States. What do you mean? They were habitually refinancing veterans under the guise that the interest rate drop of an eighth was a good idea. Take some cash out, hit them up three more months later, drop in an eighth and was just- Oh, I got a bunch of those phone calls. Yeah. So there was a lot of lenders that were doing this sort of behavior. Um, and so v Congress, it was via Senate Bill 2155, I believe it was. They modified a lot of the cash out refinance guidelines. Now there's, if you're going to do a cash out refinance, you have to meet one of eight net tangible benefits. One of eight. And it could be refinancing out of PMI, reduction of an interest rate, increase of residual income, uh, refinancing up to 90% loan to value, uh, refinancing out of a construction loan, um, reducing your interest rate. There's, there's another, there's eight. Um, so if you hit one of those, then you're always meeting the net tangible benefit requirement. Okay. What was happening was a lot of veterans were getting duped into you know, refinancing from like, oh, you're in an, let's get you an adjustable rate at 175. And then three months later, oh, the market's changing. Let's, let's refinance you to a 30 year fixed. Great. Then two months later, oh, rates are still a little bit lower, but let's do a cash out refi. Now they were just preying on these veterans that were, and it's like snazzy marketing and cool names of companies. And, and it, they look, make it look like, um, you'll get, I'll guarantee you any veteran that's watching this has probably received mail. It's like, hey, Access VA's brand new equity access program. It's BS. And I would say the word if I could, but I can't. It's it's BS. 
That's no new program, guys. The VA cash out, cash out refinance option, it's been around for years, like 76 years, 77 years. So, but they use snazzy marketing. Um, some of them are still using the seal of the US government. They're not supposed to. Right. That's a big violation. Yeah. Um, just to get you to call them. And a lot of these lenders that send the solicited, solicited mail are using artificially inflated rate sheets for them. And what it does, it allows them the ability to then hit you up six months later for a streamlined refinance. So they get two for one out of you. That's gummy lenders. I wish I could call them all out on here, but I can't. But it just, it happens. So if you get mail like that, circular file it. That's what I would tell you. Because <laughs> it's, yeah. But yeah, you can go up to 90%. Cash out of, of the, the, the appraised value of your property. This is a great, if it's used properly, um, great for veterans to consolidate debt, um, take out some cash for ho some home improvements, and not have to worry about PMI. Um, but if you are a, not a disabled veteran, in other words, you have to pay a funding fee when you refinance. It'd be a lot of money then. The refinancing a non-disabled veteran cash out refi subsequent use funding fee is 3.6%. So it's a little steep. Wow. So at a $500,000 loan, that's 15 grand. That's a funding fee. But I would say about 80% of my clients are 10% disabled or more. And I think I heard a study... Correct me if I'm wrong. You may not know or you may. I thought it was something like almost 70% of our veterans that are now transitioning out of active duty end up getting a service-connected disability. Well, I, I, I know that the, uh, the amount of disability claims and stuff that are being submitted by uh, recently returning veterans um, is more than double uh, of, oh, wow. a, of any other era. Um, but currently, I mean, the last number that I saw of the, I don't know of all the veterans in the entire um, country, but we have, you know, a little more than 9 million veterans that are enrolled in VA healthcare and somewhere between like 4.6 to 5 million of them have some percent of disability. Wow. So if the veteran has a 10% service connected disability or they're exempt and they're exempt from the, the, the funding fee, you don't have to pay it when you do the refi. So, and, where it gets tough for non-disabled veterans on the refinance is that the 90% loan to value must include the subsequent use funding fee. So really the veteran only has access to about 86.4% of equity. Still, it's better than... Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of times, you know, if the funding fee, sure, it eats up some of the equity, but at the end of the day, it's all about cash flow, right, as, as a homeowner. And you pay the subsequent use fee, 15, 12, 10, 11, 9,000, changes your payment maybe 40 to $80, not a lot. But if that refinance was done properly with the right intention, and you paid off a lot of debt and your cash flow now increases to, or your residual income increases 12, 14, 16, $1,800 a month, it's a no brainer. So it's also important to work with someone that understands how the VA works uh, in regards to the cash out refi, help you increase your residual income and put you in the right position or in a, in a better spot. And then talking about funding fees. So veterans, if you're out there looking to buy a house um, or refinance and you have not yet filed for a service-connected disability claim, make sure you file either your actual claim or your intent to file before you close on your on your loan. I can see where this is going. And you know why? I just did this for a Salem police officer. Salem police officer refinanced. They get retro? Well, yes. He paid a thirteen he paid a sixteen thousand four hundred dollar subsequent use fee on his refinance. But he knew he was gonna get adjudicated. He knew he was gonna get his claim approved. Right? He was he was based on his situation, he was pretty confident. He goes, Rick, I'm 99% sure I'm going to get rated, but 
I'm going to take the risk anyways. Like, okay. He filed his claim two weeks before we closed. He closed. No kidding. A week after we freaking closed, his claim gets approved. 60%, right? Calls me up. Hey, Rick, I'm good. Okay, send me the front page of your award letter. The award letter will say the date that you got the letter, but your effective date of disability was 35 to 45 days before we closed. So in the eyes of the VA loan guarantee, he was disabled at the time that he got the house. I reach out to my team, a couple buttons, order the VA funding fee refund request. Dude's going to get a check in the mail for 16400 cash, repaying him for his funding fee. So file your claim or at least file your intent to file before you close on a purchase or your refinance. So that way you can get your funding fee refunded to you in the event that you approve. Now, this is different for active duty, though. Active duty, unfortunately, if you're in the process of getting out, you file your claim and then you get, you. let's say you close on your house before you're officially out of the military, your claim will be the date that you get discharged. Hmm. So therefore, you can't get the funding fee refunded in that situation. There is legislation right now that they're working on to try to change that because it's not fair. Right. It's not fair. But I mean, if you, um, there's one way to around that is if you're in active duty and you're going so you're, and you're going through the process of uh, terminal leave or your ETA, you're doing your pro, you're doing your meds and all your med boards and all that stuff. Whatever you guys do, I, I don't know the proper terminology, so I apologize if I use the wrong terminology, but. If you started that process prior to discharging the military, we can um, request what's called a memorandum rating, where we have you contact the DOD and they look into your claim that you filed while you were in. And if it's long enough time has transpired, they could issue a memorandum rating and say, yes, he's going to be approved. We don't know the disability amount, but we know he's going to get rated. They send, they send a letter to the VA loan guarantee and they they and then they they re, they they waive the funding fee. It's called a memorandum rating. So it's important for our active duty personnel to know that um, if you're if you're buying a house and you're about to get out. So, Interesting. Yeah. I never heard about that before. Yeah, it's called a memorandum rating. It's got uh I tried helping a Coastie out of Gloucester right now that's doing this and it's just that he he's literally closing in 14 days and he filed his claim 2 weeks ago. So it's not going to be in the system long enough for them to decide if he's going to get rated or not. I mean, he will. He's been in for 21 years. But we won't be able to get a memorandum rating fast enough. Sometimes it takes three to four weeks, maybe five to six weeks to do that. But he understands. You know, he's just grateful that I told him to try it anyways, you know? Right. So, but he's cool. So I want to switch gears a little bit yep. um, to something that's not so fun to talk about. But hey, it happens. Um, and that's bankruptcy. So... What happens? What is what happens uh, with a VA home loan if someone defaults on it? So, if you have a foreclosure and you had a, there's a waiting period before you can use your VA again, and you can. You lose a portion of that entitlement. It's called a compromise loss. Okay. There's a two-year waiting period. So once you've hit two years, VA doesn't care. That's it. But it's minus whatever. It's minus whatever you have. And that's- as far as the VA is concerned, hey, you kind of still owe us. You owe us money. Yeah. And they'll actually like- They don't send you a bill. No, they send you a compromise loss letter when you order the certificate of eligibility on your next time that you want to buy it. Okay. And the compromise loss letter says, Dear Rick Bettencourt, unfortunately, you have a compromise loss. Here's the amount that you owe us. And um, here's your certificate of eligibility. On the COE, it'll tell you compromise loss, the VA, loan I the VA loan ID number, how much your entitlement was lost. That now triggers us to go back and use the county loan limits to determine if you have enough entitlement to do what you want to do, purchase the property that you're looking at. I had a veteran who back in the 80s, 83, 84, lost a house in Georgia. It was like an $86,000 purchase. He has a compromise loss on his certificate of eligibility. He was still able to buy a house up here, refinance it multiple times, et cetera. 
So it's, and, and I just recently had a veteran in um, uh, Central Mass. He was looking, him and his wife were looking for a big house, right? Like, you know, a million one or something like that. They're looking. But because of his compromise loss, he couldn't go to 100% financing on a million one. It was cut significantly. The down payment was going to be like 230000 because of the way the math worked, right? But he only owed the VA fifty six grand for the compromised loss that he had. So pay the VA fifty six grand and put two hundred, put one hundred seventy thousand back in your pocket because you don't need it for a down payment. So sometimes it may make sense in certain scenarios to to not pay the VA back if you're looking at a property and you lost. Thirty-seven thousand, forty-seven thousand, fifty-seven thousand dollars in entitlement, and you're looking in a high-cost county, and you're only looking for whatever that number works. Eh, don't pay them back; it's fine. But if you're looking at a bigger home, six, seven, eight, nine hundred thousand dollars, and because the compromise loss now requires you to put down one hundred thirty grand, you have to ask yourself: Well, what do I want to do? I could pay the VA back fifty-seven, and then I get full entitlement back forever and buy the house with no down payment or put down 170,000 or whatever that number is. And again, an experienced mortgage practitioner of the VA loan would be able to advise you on that. And that's what I told him. I go, listen, Joe, if you pay the VA back, I can give you 100% financing 1.1 million. If you don't, your down payment's going to be 210000 or whatever the number was. He's like, that's crazy. Of course, I'm going to pay the VA back. So he did. And now that he that the VA's, he might have a foreclosure on his credit, but it was like seven years ago. We don't care. His credit scores are awesome. He's he's paid his bill to VA. His VA entitlement is fully restored. He's good. Knock yourself out. Have fun. Blast. Pretty awesome. So foreclosure is a two-year waiting period. Chapter 7. Bankruptcy is a two-year waiting period from the discharge of the BK, Chapter 7. Chapter 13, that is a reorganization of debt. That is, I don't want to liquidate it. I'm going to pay it all back. Maybe you make too much money and the judge doesn't give you a, a, a Chapter 7, which is a full liquidation. After you've made 12 consecutive monthly payments of the repayment on the Chapter 13, you have now met the criteria and provided the court trustee okays it, you can go buy a house with your VA loan. While you're in a chapter 13. If you've completed your entire chapter 13, you've made all your payments, you, 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 and it's discharged, VA considers the repayment, the reestablishment of credit, and you're good to go. So, but for non-veterans, chapter 13s, four-year waiting period, um, chapter 13 is a bit confusing for non-vets, but Chapter seven, um, four year waiting period. Foreclosure, seven year waiting period. Short sales, four year waiting period. Veterans can get back in the hunt generally within two years, which is pretty awesome. That is awesome. Again, much more forgiving credit standards for our veterans than, than non veterans, as it should be. Well, I, I also think that, I mean, some of that plays to the fact that it's, you know, it's a, like you stated before, it's a story loan. I mean, it's, I don't know, they, they take far more into account as, oh. to, as to what's going on. I mean, I mean, there's even a chance that you could have a bankruptcy, chapter seven, you're in your 15th month, so you're not at two years yet, right? Right. And still get approved. If it was an extenuating circumstance. Like medical something or owned a house i was in afghanistan you know I, I i major major mental health trauma whatever something happened right and you lost your house for whatever reason now they can't foreclose on you when you're on active duty but there could be other things that happen when you get back and you're off so sometimes there's extenuating circumstances major medical like you just said right where okay we'll listen to the story what's the issue you better be ready to document everything because the underwriter and VA are going to be like, most likely in that case, the underwriter for the whatever lender you use will confide with the VA loan, regional loan center and their loan analyst and say, how do we, can we make this work? And if we can, how do we? 
And they both might come back and say, no, that's, we're not comfortable. Or yes, we're fine. So it's possible. No way. No way in God's great creation is that going to happen for a non-vet on a chapter seven. You're waiting four years. So it's a great opportunity. <laughs> um, gosh, I got to put my glasses on. I can't see a thing. My eyes are getting it. worse. Yeah, <laughs> this, this font is too small. Um, so we have a veteran or service member who is thinking about using their VA home loan benefit for the first time. What are three things you would tell them? If they're if they're looking right now, um, just in just in general. I mean, first time home buyer, they're a veteran or currently serving, uh, you know, active member of the military. I would say have an honest conversation with you and your partner about the financial feasibility of making this happen. Are we in a position to do this? We hear a lot of stories of young veterans um, getting married too young, active duty, getting married too quickly to get off base, to get BAH, want to buy a house. I knew a few of those. And, it ha and things happen. Have an honest financial, have an honest conversation about your financial picture right now with your partner. Are we ready? Um, research the various lenders that may be available to you. Make sure you're using a good lender. Um, and, and, and then make sure that you have a little bit of money saved up because you're going to have to have deposit escrow money. There are expenses that, that, you, that you, you will incur when buying a house. You got to pay for a home inspection. You know, uh, you should get the home inspected, I should say. You're going to have the appraisal, VA appraisal. You're going to have to get homeowner's insurance. And those are real costs. And if you have no money at all, given VA allows gifts from family members or anybody for that matter. But, you know, if you're going to go on, and, you know, and I would say get your credit checked, you know. I mean, have your credit checked long before you're getting ready to pull the trigger to know that we are where we're supposed to be. I need to interject something real quick. I didn't think to ask this before. Does it matter which credit bureau? They all change. So there, there's TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. Right. They, it just depends on the lender. It, well, no, it depends on the bureaus that day. Like I might pull your credit on a Monday and your middle FICO score might, the, the one that we use might be TransUnion. Pull it next week, it could be Experian. Pull it the week after that, it might be a, a, a Equifax. It all changes. So it, it, there's really, the bureaus aren't static. Okay. All right. So back to the three pieces of information. So you're talking about, hey, are we really in a, in a place to make this decision? Yeah. Or, or, or to, you know, purchase a home, chat with your partner about it. Um, Have the, on, an honest conversation. Right. Like, I mean, what's the bills? What's the more, what's the potential mortgage payment? What are we, that's the other thing is, what are you comfortable paying? So many times veterans come to me and go, what am I pre-qualified for? It's really, that's not the question really. It's what do you want to spend? Yeah. How much do you want to spend? Well, I want to be around $1,500 a month. Okay. Where are you looking? Massachusetts. <laughs> okay. Well, I can tell you, you're not in Boston, Essex County, Suffolk County, Middlesex County, or Norfolk County for the most part. Very expensive part of the country. So where are you looking to buy? Oh, no, no, Rick. I'm in like North Adams, Pittsfield, uh, Berkshires. Okay. Different, different conversation. So first, what do I want to spend per month? What are we good with? That's something I can't tell you. No mortgage professional can tell you what you want to spend. You can, right? Then where are you looking? Then that allows me to go ahead and take a look and see what some properties might be, what some annual property taxes might be. And then we work backwards and say, okay, if you're looking in Western Mass and you want to be around $1,500 a month, then you're looking at properties between $195 and $250. Oh, Rick, they're condos. Well, now we have to add in the condo fee and that's going to reduce your buying power by 10 grand, 20 grand, 30 grand or whatever oh, yeah. it is. Yeah, there's a lot of HOAs around here. There's three, yeah. to, three to $700 a month. So honest conversation about finances. What do I want to spend? <coughs> What's comfortable for me? Um, 
aggressive research on the, the, the VA lenders that you're going to work with. Um, ask around your friends, your peers, and then get your credit checked by, by a lender to see where, you're, where you stand. And, you know, um, you should know your employment situation, how your job's going. Uh, you know, that's going to be the, the mortgage professional ask you very, like, you know, what's your two-year work history type of thing. If you show that you're bouncing job to job to job to job to job, there's a, there could be a problem there. Could be an issue. Are you not a good worker? Is there some mental health issues that, that you know, that might be, maybe it's not a good time to buy a house right now. If you're going from job to job to job and you can't hold a job down, is it is it a good time to buy a house? I don't know. It's tough. And, you know, I'm not one to say that, but um, I think buying a house is a mental, physical, emotional sort of conversation that you have to have, well, you know, with yourself and your partner because that's, you don't want to, you don't want to go ahead and buy a house and then not be able to afford it because then it, then it gets kind of dicey and for future situations. That makes things tough. It could depends on where you're going. It depends. You know what I mean. But I think at the end of the day, if if you have that conversation with yourself, you get your credit checked, you find a good lender, and you know where you're supposed to be, and it works, then it's a good time to buy. Whether this property or not at that time, I don't know. There's nothing around here right now. No. Lowest inventory we've seen in pretty much recorded housing history right now. I, lo I looked the other day and particular towns had like seven to 15 properties. And that included land. Yeah, like I, was, <laughs> I was talking to a, a real estate appraiser that I know. And um, he checked like Peabody, where I'm from originally on the North Shore is, a, is an affordable community. Their property taxes are pretty low. Uh, the, the way that they assess is, 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 is pretty low. And there was, I think this was three weeks ago, there was nothing for sale for like five days. Not one property? Not one house. Not one condo, not one single family, not one multifamily. Nothing was on the market. It was a goose egg. Never seen that happen in my 18 years. They've subsequently since then come on. There's some properties that have come on now, but that's crazy. Oh yeah. So generally, the the real estate industry wants about nine months of inventory at any given time. There's like one or two months right now. It's it's down like fifty five percent from last year. You're like what? Some parts of the country are gonna be. I know there's probably people gonna see this all over the country. Check your market as well. You know, are there properties? in your price range, in your market. You're going to have to expand that search a little bit. Excuse me, you might have to. Hmm. It's tough. So that was like 20 plus questions about VA home loans. Is there anything really, really, really important that should be talked about for the audience that we haven't covered? Really, that we haven't covered? Um. I would say, I mean, other than the topics that we, were, yeah, all right, I we're, mean, we're going to go ahead and make another show. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I would say be, be, you know, be your own advocate for your benefit that you earned. Uh, don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. You men and women out there that served our country, which by the way, I'm insanely grateful. Thank you for your service. Um, you earned this benefit. This is yours. And don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. So advocate for yourself. Use colorful language if you had to. <laughs> drive, drive, I'm sure. Hey, listen, I've done loans for, I've been working with veterans for 18 years. And sometimes I'll get in front of an audience of veterans and, 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 and I'll start out my presentation one way and I'm like, this isn't working. And then I'll turn on my colorful language portion of the conversation and it's like eyes, eyes open up, ears perk up and people are like, oh, now I get it, right? But be an advocate for yourself. Um, make sure you have an advocate for you. You know, it's the best home loan out there for only our military service members that that earn that earn the right uh, to to use it. So um, be relentless. Uh, be a self advocate. Connect with a good advocate for you, and and be a good communicator. Getting a home loan is not a problem, but you have to be a good communicator, right? And you got to be. You got to be sort of 
you have to hold yourself accountable as well. Like if I ask you for a W-2, don't send me half a W-2. You laugh. This has happened. This is anybody. This is like, this is in the military community and the non-military community. It's, it's, but it, I can't use your bank statement if I can't see your name. I don't know whose money it is. So, you know, we, we just helped a, a police officer in, in Everett and literally we were able to close that loan almost three weeks ahead of schedule because he was very, he held himself accountable for his job in the transaction. And if we needed documents, they were delivered legibly, complete, quickly, no problem. And understood why we had to get it. And it was a great experience. He's like, this is the easiest thing I've ever done. I, I, I can't even believe this, Rick. This is like simple. And he had a phenomenal real estate agent too, by the way. This is a great story too. He, I don't know why the seller even accepted his offer. He made an offer in this house in Everett, a uh, Medford, sorry, Medford, Massachusetts. And there were two cash offers $25,000 more than his. And the seller took his offer because he was a veteran. <laughs> That's awesome. That's, dude, seller just gave up 25 Lodge. Cash offer. No financing, no anything. Come to find out, she just loved veterans. Her family was deep-rooted military. She just wanted, and she didn't need the money, but she... She, and he was a police officer. She loved veterans and she loved police officers. So she's like, I'm doing this. And a listing agent was like, but, uh-uh. You know what I mean? So be a self-advocate, self-accountable. Um, do your research on the lender that you so choose to use. And um, don't give up. And if, if you're, and if you have some credit issues, own them up. Own it. Like, you know what I mean? Hey. No, that if it's if you legitimately don't if you legitimately have a, a a collection or a judgment on your credit that's not yours, fight for it. Or if it was put there uh, as a resulting uh, from a divorce or something like that, and it's joint, I get it. Do your best to get it off. But if you owe the debt, fix it. I don't know. How, I mean, you can, there's a couple different ways to fix it, right? But it's going to make it harder to buy that house if there's a lot of collections on there, things of that nature, you know. Um, What's that? One one in the hand isn't worth two in the bush or something like that. Yeah. You know, if you got a four hundred dollar credit card collection that you think you were late on, you you think you you paid it on time, but they're saying you didn't. You, do you really want to hold it up buying a house for four hundred bucks? So sometimes the situations like that, but you know, it's 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 all about getting your ducks in a row. And I and I like I said, I, I think being your self-advocate um, and then partnering with a strong advocate, like a really good VA mortgage practitioner, mortgage professional. And I think you'll have a really good experience. I don't think you'll have a bad experience. I mean, sellers sometimes can be tough, but it is what it is in the market where it is right now. But don't give up. It's the best loan out there, guys. It's the best loan. Yeah, it's a good way to finish right there. Best loan. So Rick, thank you so much for coming on the sit rep again i love it man this hey. is great you know i'll tell you i i, I speak every all, time you come we have a new set <laughs> i speak all over the country uh, you know i've been I, I was a panelist at the va lender conference uh 2018 or 2000 2018 they asked uh, the department of va asked me to be a guest panelist on some of the origination side of things i was a guest panelist at the military influencer conference so i speak all over the country on this and uh i love your show because you you have Great questions. And I could literally sit here for another three hours and we could go over like so much stuff, but I don't have I, enough SD cards. Yeah. You do. A, <laughs> you do a phenomenal job. And I, I appreciate you inviting me out here and, and being a part of this. And, uh, and I thank you and uh, hopefully somebody gets something out of it and, and it makes a difference. Sounds good. Yeah, man. So to everybody out there in the audience, if you stuck around for this entire podcast, uh, good for you. One, thank you for doing <laughs> that. Uh, hopefully you've hit the like button by now. Yeah. Um, but uh, again, Rick, thanks so much for coming out. Uh, we will have 
a bunch of information about all this stuff that we've talked about uh, in the video description below. So go ahead and check that out. Some contact information. If you've got follow-up questions, feel free to go down there and, and reach out to us and let us know uh, additional questions that we may not have answered. Or maybe you're in a particular part of the country and you've got a question for there. So just let us know. Thanks for hanging around and we will see you again on the sit rep. Always remember, whether it's on the internet browser, YouTube, wherever, just search hashtag the sit rep. You have questions, we have answers. The sit rep is your trusted source for veterans benefits information with expert analysis and interviews with leaders from the field. To find past shows, podcasts, and other content, search hashtag the sit rep on YouTube.